Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks, Martin, for, for the nice introduction and for, for having me, but most importantly to all the organizers for pulling this seminar series off. Uh, it's uh, one of my Monday morning treats every other week to, to join the talks. And it's, it's so cool to be, uh, be speaking here and giving this talk to, um, what is it, like a hundred of my best new friends. Um, okay, uh, so today's talk is going to connect uh, machine learning and optimal transport. Um, and um, basically the idea is to have like a bi-directional exchange um, between these two areas that of course both uh, have been quite popular in, in, in recent years or decades or in, in, in the optimal transport case even for centuries. So uh, the talk is divided into two parts. The first one is uh, new tricks from learning. So let's uh, focus on optimal transport. And I'm gonna show you how uh, techniques from machine learning can be used to solve optimal transport problems in, in high dimensions. So we are interested in high dimensional mappings of densities. Um, and basically what, what we are gonna do is we will work with, with a dynamical perspective of optimal transport, um, look at it in three different ways from a macroscopic, microscopic um, point of view and also study the optimality conditions given by Hamilton jacobi bellman equations. And based on that, um, we, we've come up uh, over the last uh, half a year or so with, uh, with new solvers that incorporate neural networks um, and, uh, and combine a few other tricks in the numerical um, treatment of, of neural networks that um, we've been developing over the last few years. Um, and that gives us actually quite a general uh, framework for, uh, that also extends beyond OT to something like mean field games, mean field control problems. Um, and um, that part of the talk is, basic, is based on an article um, that, that we've recently um, written with Stan Osha and his group uh, during my time at IPAM last semester. Um, and then in the second uh, bit of the talk, I'm gonna motivate why would you even care about high dimensional OT problems? Typically we're used to, to solving optimal transport in two or three dimensions, it seems at least in imaging, um, but high dimensional problems arise in machine learning actually quite a lot. So, Let's uh, learn from these old tricks. So let's apply OT in, in, in machine learning uh, to a problem uh, of variational inference. Um, so there's a, a branch of continuous normalizing flows, it's called in the machine learning community. And uh, it turns out bringing in optimal transport knowledge um, really simplifies, regularizes the problem. And together with the right numerics can actually give uh, quite drastic speed ups there both in terms of uh, the training time, but also in terms of using these models, because you typically want to generate samples. And that's uh, subject to uh, work uh, some of my students have been doing. Um, that should be out by the end of this week. Okay, so let's get started with, uh, with machine learning for high dimensional OT and more, because it generalizes to uh, mean field games. So that work happened uh, during my semester at IPAM uh, last, last uh, fall. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the uh, organizers of the long program on machine learning and physics that I was part of. And especially thanks for, uh, thankful for, for all the nice collaborations I had with these uh, four guys, without whom nothing of this would have ever happened. Uh, we met basically al almost every day. They tutored me, taught me everything uh, we needed to know and, uh, um, and also helped putting everything together here. Um, so huge uh, thanks to them. And, and most credits, of course. Um, so um, for those who, who haven't, haven't seen it, let me define uh, the dynamic optimal transport problem. Uh, so what you're given is an initial density, I'll call that row zero, and a target density, row one. And then the goal is to find the velocity uh, so that the push forward map that you get from, by following uh, this velocity field um, pushes row zero to row one and also minimizes the transport cost. So a very important term is, is this uh, cost functional here, which uh, roughly speaking uh, looks at how much density do you have uh, at some x and time t. Um, and the more density you have, uh, the higher the price you pay for, uh, for pushing, pushing that little mass around. Um, and that is given by the norm of v. And here, and throughout the talk, we will only talk about L2 uh, measures of transport cost. There are other measures, but, uh, but that's good enough for us for now. Um, and then you have a PDE constraint that's given by the continuity equation, but um, not only do you have an initial condition that uh, rho, which is like a time sequence uh, of, of densities, starts at rho zero, 
you also have uh, the constraint that it and actually it uh, ends at row one. So it's sort of a boundary value problem if you look at it in time. And if you solve this problem, uh, you'll see, uh, you, you'll obtain like a density evolution like so. So you see uh, in, in this example, you have eight uh, small blobs um, that are kind of spread out and you have one big blob in the center. And the solution to this problem is uh, by, by moving everything to the center. And what you also see is so the intensity here, here does change because mass is accumulating in a small area, okay? Um, and so then you get basically, so this is the push forward um, of row zero is uh, just the last time step um, of, the, of the rows. Okay, so that's a classical um, um, uh, approach here for, for optimal transport. It uh, can be solved with convex programming. Uh, we'll come back to that in the beginning. And it was pioneered uh, by uh, Ben Amou and Bernier with a really landmarking paper on that, on that topic in 2000. Okay, um, so I'm gonna re relax this problem for, for the rest of the talk. Um, so what I've, what I've done here in this slide, I've dropped the final time constraint here on the, on the row at time one being equal to row one, and I made it a soft constraint. So I have a functional G here, think about it as, an, as a kuhlbach leibler divergence or an L2 um, dis discrepancy between these two, um, that this, between these two density that uh, sort of enforces the final time constraint in a, in a soft penalty. And the reason to do this is because then uh, you can think about the OT problem or the relaxed OT problem as something called a potential mean field game, which is a really exciting area also to, to look in and, and to learn about. Um, it doesn't really change anything. So the solution still is you push all the mass to the middle and you still, if you now uh, pull, um, have a large enough parameter here in front of the G, you will get exactly the same result. Um, okay. I mean, that's, that's, uh, but it really simplifies uh, the mathematical development here in the sense that you now only have to uh, solve the continuity equation textbook style forward in time uh, to simulate the dynamics once you have a given V. Okay. Um, once you have, once you think about this as a potential mean field gain, um, you can look at it as from a microscopic perspective. Um, so to motivate that really quick in one slide, I put you a picture here. Um, so think about you have an agent, uh, so this is time, time zero on the top here. So think about each of these points being like an agent. And the agent needs to find out um, where to move to. So you can phrase this, uh, you can, you can phrase this as, a, as a cost functional um, where the agent uh, starts at x at time zero. And then the cost it pays is basically how far it moves. So that's the, the, the uh, transport cost that we saw on the previous slide. Um, and then you have uh, a G here, but note that the letter now has changed. Uh, so this is a different G. It's related to the, to the curly G from the previous side, uh, slide uh, by being its variational derivative. So there is uh, some, some requirements this G has to satisfy and some mechanism also how to derive it then. Um, so that is the cost that an individual agent um, faces when it follows uh, the, um, um, the, the velocity um, in, in time here. Uh, so the dynamics here are given. Um, so the position Z, which is this, this red line here, uh, is computed by looking at the current velocity and, uh, and following it for a little bit. So it's an, it's an ODE, you integrate forward in time, starting at the original position, ending up at the final position. So here you can now see um, basically exactly the same thing that you, we've, we saw in the video earlier, just uh, visualized in terms of uh, these, uh, these lines here. Um, and then clearly this, uh, this Z, so every of these line is the characteristic curve uh, of the continuity equation that starts at a point X at the solution, okay? Um, it's, well, it's important to see that um, this G here involves rho, which we saw on the previous slide as the density of the, uh, of the whole, let's call it the population density um, at a position and a time, uh, at a final time in this case. So um, it's not okay for an agent to just uh, minimize their, their, their cost here. Um, the agent uh, basically is interacting with, um, oh, sorry, uh, so the agent is, uh, is, uh, is, is interacting with the population uh, in here. Um, 
Okay. Um, so the the final thing uh, I should say is that uh, there is a, a hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So that's the optimality condition um, of, of the problem. And the optimality condition um, was, was derived by Lazare and Leon um, as the first order optimality condition of the OT problem is given by, by hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So you have two sets of equations. One is in, in phi. And I forgot to say, so for, for phi x comma t is basically, um, if I go back to the slide here, um, if one of these agents optimizes um, the trajectory here, so picks the, picks the best v, picks this characteristics, then the value you get from, from, from j is, is called phi of x comma zero. So that's called um, the value function um, of, of, the, of the problem. And the value function is related, um, or is, is actually uh, the optimality condition of the relaxed OT problem. So, it, and it satisfies another um, important PDE. So that's like a Burgess type equation um, that in this case goes backward in time. That's why I have a minus partial T here. So it starts from a final time condition that is given by, by G, which is our terminal cost, um, how well the densities basically match, and goes backward in time. And uh, still, the, the other part of the optimality system is going to be the continuity equation. Um, but what's more is that um, the optimal velocity is actually given as a negative gradient of the uh, value function. So this means that these two PDEs here are really intimately coupled um, together uh, to, to solve the problem. And um, in, in some way, um, you have kind of three different ways to look at this problem now. So originally I, I, I wrote down a variational problem. You can solve that uh, for V. Uh, you can, for each of the um, agents, solve um, the microscopic problem, or you can uh, choose to solve uh, this set of PDEs. And it's a little bit challenging. I mean, each of them has, has a few challenges and I'll talk a, a bit more about this. Uh, what's a bit challenging here is that you have a forward-backward structure in these PDEs. So the continuity equation comes with an initial time constraint, the HJB with a final time constraint, and they are, they're really tightly coupled because the, 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 uh, the, the phi enters, um, enters the continuity equation. Um, and of course, uh, this can become a high-dimensional PDE. So, so the, the, the V here um, is going to be um, depending on the, your space dimension. So in my case, uh, on this slide, it's currently d equal to two. So it's, it's basically a done deal how to solve these problems. But think about d equal uh, to be 100, then this becomes a little bit more difficult to solve these, these type of PDs. Um, what I do want to show you, though, is uh, back to our original problem to show you how the, va how, the, how the value function looks like. So this is the optimal value function that, that I computed here. And you can really see if you followed its negative gradient, uh, you would go downhill and blue means down and yellow means up, or larger values and smaller values. Um, so then you, you can see that everything is pushed in the middle and this function, so both of these functions kind of uh, move in time. Um, and they really dictate the, the, the whole dynamics. Uh, so once you have found phi, basically you're done. Because um, you, you have phi at, at every xt, you know the optimal velocity, and you can, you can solve the continuity equation and you're done. But it's really the, the, the big question is, is how to get there. And by the way, so for people who have uh, solved dynamical optimal transport problems in the past, if you used, for example, a primal dual Newton method or, or any primal dual method, um, phi would be basically be your Lagrange multiplier that you get out. Uh, maybe uh, plus or minus some scaling that you need to apply. But it's, it's really beautiful that, th that these things come together. Okay, so. What's now the, the main idea of our work? Um, um, there are three options uh, for solving the problem. You can minimize the functional, uh, either with respect to um, rho and v, or if you now know the optimality conditions behind it, um, you, you can uh, actually uh, parameterize the v directly by minus grad phi. So that has, uh, of course, some, some implications because now you only look for a scalar field. Um, and you have basically the, the, the physics from the optimality conditions already built in. So that's a variational problem. Um, you could minimize um, uh, the x comma t, so, so that's a j for an individual agent for many, many points. 
uh, with respect to, to V or minus grad phi as well. So that I will call the microscopic view. The nice thing here is it's almost parallel. Um, I mean, I say almost because uh, we saw that the terminal cost involved the row. So um, that's going to be, uh, that's, uh, that's typically a challenge here. That, uh, I'll show you how we overcome this. Um, or you can compute the value function by solving uh, the HJB and the continuity equation. And uh, that is a bit challenging because it's very high dimensional PDEs. Uh, the variation problem perhaps uh, seems the easiest option, but, but really I want you to think about high dimensions where you have to find ways to represent uh, the row and the B. Okay, uh, so here's our idea. Uh, we combine all the advantages of the above methods and uh, forget about the disadvantages and thereby uh, tackle the curse of dimensionality. So that was, the big, that was the idea in the beginning of the semester at IPAM and we got pretty close, I'll show you. Um, so what we'll do is we'll uh, formulate the whole thing as a variational problem. That seems most natural to all of us. Um, then we eliminate the continuity equation using a Lagrangian PDE solver. So that, that way, we, we become mesh free and also parallel for the row part of things. Um, then what's left is um, we need to kind of express phi, which is also a function in, in space and time. And for this, we use a neural network. Um, and um, there is a, there are a lot of study things about that. The networks are universal approximators. Definitely they are mesh free. I mean, it's a parameterization. So you can plug in your input uh, x comma t and you get uh, an output which is just a number and you don't need a mesh for doing this, just some linear algebra operations. Um, the, the rumor on the street is that these are cheap. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, and then there is a final ingredient. Um, we also make use of the HJB conditions because remember these are the optimality conditions that the phi has to satisfy. So uh, to, to reduce the number of training points, what uh, we are doing here is um, um, we are gonna um, we're, we're gonna penalize those um, those uh, variations on the grid. So that's supposed to give us uh, regularity and and uh, maybe even sometimes uh, convergence to uh, to global optimize. I'll show you. Um, uh, on, on, on one note here, so this may sound like a very convincing story and like a paper you can write in an afternoon. Um, I think um, it has a lot of interesting aspects on all these parts. Uh, for example, there was a lot of calculus involved in deriving everything in moving coordinates and Lagrangian methods and, and all that. Um, and then when we came to the point of uh, representing Pi with a neural network, everyone uh, was uh, breaking out in joy and, and, and celebrations because uh, they have these, uh, this hype around them and the uh, properties uh, from, from approximation theory. But you realize quite quickly that it really matters uh, what kind of detailed choices you, you pick there. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that and reveal a few tricks under the hood that we've, we've learned uh, in this project. So it is not uh, necessarily that always the cheapest option and it's not or for sure not the, not the easiest option. You need to be actually quite careful with these things. Um, okay, so let's go one by one. Let's look at the Lagrangian method. So that is, um, numerical PDE uh, standard, standard stuff more or less. Um, so if you give me the value function, then I can solve the continuity equation um, along characteristic curves. So you have uh, the following equation. So uh, rho at, uh, at z comma t um, times the determinant of the Jacobian of this mapping that maps you uh, from x to z comma to, to, to z. Um, um, is equal to rho zero of x. So that is uh, um, basically, you can think about this as a mont equation uh, for the mapping that maps x to z of x comma t. Um, and the characteristic curve you can compute quite easily by uh, just starting at x and then you follow the negative uh, gradient of the value function. Um, okay, then the challenge here probably is what to do about this uh, Jacobi determinant, especially in high dimensions, um, and also thinking already about um, maybe aspects of neural networks, like how do you actually compute a gradient of a neural network? We'll talk a little bit more about that. That is uh, quite tricky. Uh, fortunately, um, you can, instead of computing the Jacobi determinant directly, which you know, 
may, you may think as a, as a D cube flops and we want to beat the curse of dimensionality. And also you may not have access to this as a matrix. You can do the following. You can um, get its log determinant by integrating the Laplacian of the value function along the characteristics. So that is oftentimes called the instantaneous change of variables formula. You can derive it from Jacobi formula in many different ways. So we will use this and call this uh, L for log determinant x comma t. And just to show you how this works, so this is our original data set uh, where we had these eight uh, blobs uh, spaced out. What I've done is I've sampled from them. So I've put a, put a sample in all of these locations. Um, and now in time, we, we can see all of these particles, so to say, move uh, to the center and then form uh, form this blob um, that uh, was the target distribution. Okay, so let's play this one more time. So you see that all the points are moving inside. The, the ones in the middle are basically staying, and in the end, you see that um, they turn from they become the intensity grows. So they start out all in blue, and then they become brighter because the mass is accumulating in a smaller region. And exactly that uh, change of these intensities is given by the um, Jacobi determinant, um, uh, which again, you can compute in this way. And so if, if, you, if you are to, to code this, uh, what, I, what I recommend you do is um, you write this integral here as another ODE. It's not so much really an ODE because it uh, doesn't really control anything uh, in there. Um, it's really just an integration, but you write the integration as an ODE and then you can um, solve them in one pass. So you have one more component in your ODE solve um, for each point, and you can parallelize this over all the points. So this is a completely parallel solver of the continuity equation, which uh, is what we wanted because in the final time condition, we need uh, an estimate of the density. So now if we know the density rho zero in the beginning, then we can uh, have, a, have a good estimate of that or we can have an estimate. Uh, let's not comment on how good this is because uh, Lagrangian methods um, uh, stand, for example, was very scared about these in the beginning and uh, I had to convince them to, so that they work. And I'm still, by the, by, by the way, um, I know that there are many things that can go wrong and um, it's amazing that these, these things actually work sometimes, um, especially on a discrete level. Okay, so having, having this ingredient, you can write a giant um, um, optimization problem and um, go, since we want to go into uh, high dimensional uh, spaces, um, the, the way we write this is now as an expected value. So all these integrals become expected values now. Um, and the cost function here has a, has a cost for the Lagrangian term. And let's look at this for a second. So the Lagrangian term turns out you can also accumulate. So if you integrate, so remember so the, the, the Z is given by the negative gradient of the phi. And so the transport cost for, for a given x is basically you integrate the, uh, gradient, the norm of the gradient square of that phi. And then you use that in your functional in the end. Um, so, th so these, uh, like the second component, which you've seen on the previous slide, um, the, this component is also um, just an integral you could compute. But I write it in the, into the ODE so that, uh, to emphasize that it can all be done in one pass. Um, and then we have the terminal cost G. We have, um, yeah, now we have, uh, we have one new term here. So the, the CH here, um, look at this one for a second. So that is the violation of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation um, along the characteristic. So this is all computed in coordinate Z here, like all the other terms as well. And what we do here is we just penalize the absolute value and accumulate this. So it's kind of like, an, it's motivated by exact penalty methods, um, but you could use any other penalty if you like. And then um, this last term here that we have added is, uh, a vi is uh, penalizing the violation of the final time condition in the HJB. So we look at the potential or the value function at time one and compare it to uh, what it's supposed to be from the, from the HJB. So that is, a, that is then um, a, a, a problem. You can um, now, wait, you you can uh, basically realize so the, so the z and the l we need uh, to compute the continuity equation the cl and the ch accumulate every all the costs along the characteristics 
by the way, it's actually uh, was quite an interesting observation for us that you can do this. So um, this really pops out of the change of variables formula, for example, that you don't have to have the row in, in, in this. We look at each particle at a time, but you also saw it already in the microscopic view. So that's really um, motivated by that. Uh, you have some penalty parameters, um, typically not so difficult to choose, but you know we have to um, find a way. And then really what we do is uh, we want to discretize and optimize the whole problem. So we discretize the dynamics, so the ODE, uh, with a fixed number of uh, steps with an RK4 method. Um, it's supposed to be a good time integrator. Um, here, the big cost driver, of course, is this NT. You, you want to take as few time steps as possible um, during the optimization. Um, and um, that motivates us also to use the discretize optimize uh, approach. Um, the expected value we discretize with Monte Carlo. So either you give me samples from row zero, then it's just a one over n and you sum up all the different losses, or you give me just some samples and then uh, we will reweight them uh, if we can compute row zero for each of the samples. So that's important sampling. Um, and then you can use uh, stochastic approximation schemes like SGD or Adam. Um, or what, what uh, we typically prefer um, is uh, stochastic uh, sample average approximations. So you take larger batches, but then you use uh, BFGS or Newton type methods uh, to solve the problem. Um, no matter what you pick here, you will not need uh, to use a grid. And you can compute, the the, or compute everything in parallel over all the particles. So this is this uh, constraint here. You have to think about, uh, you have to do this for all the particles. So you have to really um, uh, solve this many, many times, but uh, it's all parallel. Um, and um, the, the, the last missing piece is we need to find a way to evaluate the value function and its gradient and its Laplacian, because that's what we, we will need uh, to compute this whole thing. Um, and for this now, I'm gonna introduce a neural network representation that uh, is suitable in the sense that we can very efficiently compute uh, all these terms that, that, that we need here. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, deep learning, not so much. Uh, if you have not been asleep the last couple of years, uh, you've, you've heard that uh, there was uh, apparently a deep learning revolution, but also uh, questionable how much it has actually happens in the 50s, except for much more compute and much more data sets and, uh, and uh, honestly also nicer software and, uh, and some other enabling technologies. But it's one of uh, one of the hot areas. So I've, I'm assuming you've seen these pictures. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit more mathy way. So we have inputs and we have outputs. In our case, it's already set up for us. So we have uh, th think about a 2D problem. So you have uh, x1, x2, and time, and you get the value function. So that's phi at, at x comma t. And in between, some magic stuff happens. Um, there are different ways to build a neural network, and I'll build one from scratch for you in the next few slides. Um, and, but typically, what they consist of is uh, fine mappings and some nonlinearities, also called um, activation functions. And then uh, you stack a few of these uh, um, um, after another, and then hopefully, magic things happen in terms of uh, their expressibility and, and uh, and also their generalization. Um, the big crux, of course, is uh, you need to design the network and you need to find all the weights, so the Ks and the Bs, um, to, to actually achieve your goal, which in our case was given by the optimization problem we just talked about. Okay, um, so here's uh, what, what we chose to do. Uh, it's, uh, you can be very creative here um, and um, use many, many different uh, uh, models. What we chose is to go some, somewhat simple um, and, um, and um, go in a way that we can control basically the internals of the network quite well, at least uh, as much as you can these days. Uh, so we write S as the input feature. So that's X comma T, it's a D plus one dimensional tuple, um, our vector. And then we uh, build a model, you can think about it as a neural network plus a quadratic um, for the value function. So we have um, the, the, the phi here. Um, we now expose that it depends on the parameter theta. So theta is our uh, weight vector. It collects everything that is trainable, okay? I don't, don't overthink what's in there. I, I write you down the ingredients here. Um, but that's really the weights you want to tune. They break down into weights for the neural network, n, 
um, and uh, this W, uh, so the neural network can have more than one output. So then we use uh, just a, just a, a linear uh, mapping to go down to uh, like an inner product with a vector W to go down to 1D. And uh, then you have the quadratic part in here and a shift. And so what's trainable is the W, the theta N, the A, uh, the C, and the B. And for the network, uh, we pick a, a ResNet with M layers. Uh, M can be really, really embarrassingly small, like two or something like that. So it's not really a deep network, uh, but it, it works. And then the forward propagation, so you start with S, then you first have one layer that is like uh, just computing an affine transformation with K0 and B0 and an activation function here. Um, and the K0 here does not have to be square, okay? So K0 can be uh, going from, let's, let's say goes to M dimension. So little m would be the, the width of the network. Um, and then the other layers are written as ResNet layers. So you take U0, you keep it, um, so that's called a skip connection, and you add H times um, another of these layers applied to U0. And uh, the H here is, think about it as a small time step size, because then the ResNet can be seen also as, a, as an ODE, actually. Um, and finally, when you do this after M of these steps, you just compute the W transpose times UM, and then there you have your whatever you need to plug into the model. Um, so since we need the gradient of this two, um, uh, I'm going to give you one more option here um, that for us has been actually quite valuable. So usually in machine learning frameworks, you can get the gradient basically for free with automatic differentiation. And there are good reasons to rely on automatic differentiation, but I want to show you um, that this is not always the best thing. So especially for, for such a forward propagation, it is actually quite easy to compute what's called the backward propagation or just basically apply chain rule. So you flip all these things upside down and then you differentiate each line uh, one by one, okay? So you differentiate um, this uh, W transpose UM with respect to UM and you get a W. And then you plug that in and, get a, and call this ZM plus one. Uh, and then you go, go back through the layers and uh, in each step, it's not maybe so important to really, to really um, see what's, uh, how, how to derive these. Uh, you, can, you can do this. It's just basically standard calculus. But you can see that this is uh, kind of also looking like a ResNet. So you have a, a skip connection backward in time. And, um, and yeah, you, you kind of go, 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 through, uh, go through in time. And then at some point, you have a Z0, which is then the gradient of W transpose times N with respect to S, so with respect to your input features. And that's what you, what you need uh, to compute the time derivative and the space derivative of, of, uh, of phi. And uh, the benefit of doing this manually so you're not um, losing anything in terms of uh, over automatic differentiation. I mean, you have to write it and you have to debug it. But uh, the nice thing is you have then all these intermediate gradients here um, that you can use to compute the Laplacian. Because remember, we're not done yet. For the volume change, we need the Laplacian of the network, uh, which, is, uh, which you can write as a, as a, as a trace. Uh, so you can um, uh, multiply the Hessian with uh, some uh, basically think about identity matrices left and right and take the trace, but the identity matrices are used to not worry about the time component. That I want to show you now. So if you want to compute the Laplacian of the network, you can write it as uh, the Laplacian of, uh, of the value function as the plus Laplacian of the network plus uh, this A part from the quadratic. That is simple. So let's sweep it under the rug um, and focus on the first part. And you realize after having done the previous exercise, if you now go through um, the gradient forward in time and computed the Hessian and, and its, uh, its trace, you can actually derive um, a, a very handy formula for the trace. So that's something we've done. Um, and uh, in the end of the day, what it involves is a derivative of the activation function. So that is uh, typically something really simple to compute. Um, a dot-wise product with the gradient that we've derived. And so this is going to give you a vector. And then in here, you basically have uh, a, a, a matrix, uh, a Hadamard product with itself. So you just square all the entries and multiply it with a vector of all ones. So all this does here, all this requires you to do is uh, to take a look at this matrix, square all the entries, um, multiply them with a vector, and sum them all up. So it's, uh, it's a really cheap computation uh, to compute the trace. 
And you can uh, go through the network and then uh, have the whole trace or the whole Laplacian here um, as, as a sum of T0 with, with all the Ti's. Uh, the only costly part here is that for the deeper layers, you have uh, a J in here, which is a Jacobian matrix. So that is a, a Jacobian of the uh, current feature with respect to the input features. So that is a matrix that is M, if you have uh, M of width times B. Um, that you need to accumulate, that costs you a little bit, like M squared D. Um, but you can do this and you don't have to keep the memory uh, in here. And I'm going to show you how, how well that works actually in, in runtime. Because also from a parallel computing point of view, think about using a GPU to train your neural network. All this uh, part is very uh, GPU friendly. Okay. Um, and yeah, the overall call is M squared D. So the linear in the dimension, quadratic in the width. Um, okay, some experiments. So here's an experiment uh, where, where we wanted to single out the uh, Henry Jacobi Bellman penalty. Um, what you see is here our, our initial and target density. And you see three, di three different results. So this left one is what I would propose, is that you use, um, that you enforce the Hamilton jacobi bellman equation, um, which is uh, kind of a redundant thing to do because it's the optimality condition. But if you penalize its, its uh, deviations, you can get away with a network that only has two time steps, really, um, to basically get the job done here in terms of matching the, the densities. And you have what you can see down here is your straight characteristics. Whereas if you used, if you were greedy and used only two time steps and didn't use the penalty, uh, really bad things would happen. So, so this image in the top should look like the initial density is the pullback of row, row one, and then the push forward, these, these, these should also be looking relatively simple or similar uh, up to some scaling. Um, but yeah, you see characteristics here, crossing and curving. So really the scary part of the Lagrangian method. And you can combat that with more time steps, uh, then it's also going away. But uh, the penalty that we have here actually achieves better results with, uh, with a quarter of the time steps. So why not use that? Uh, so that was something we're really happy with. Then uh, one other thing we've done is we've compared our solver to a Eulerian method, like think about dynamical OT solvers that are out there. We took one from Eldad's and Raya's uh, paper. Um, so we uh, pulled all the bells and whistles. So we use a conservative uh, method. Uh, this gives us a convex problem. We use the Newton's method, let it run. And here's what we got. So you see the Lagrangian method, the machine learning framework on the left, and you see the Eulerian on the right. So they look relatively sim similar. And also in terms of like loss values, um, so I, pr I plot the overall objective function value, which by the way, I've uh, evaluated with a different solver altogether just to make this fair. Um, you see that uh, our networks here actually do quite well. Um, uh, interestingly to see, so if you use a coarse mesh um, for, the, for the Eulerian method, you actually do quite well already, um, but uh, the suboptimality is like a one and a half percent or so. Uh, if you go to a fine mesh, um, which I took as a gold standard here, uh, you can beat it uh, with enough time steps in our time integrator and doing the right things in the optimization. And you get down from about 3 million to 600 parameters. So, I mean, it's, uh, these methods uh, actually really are competitive, it seems. And in terms of the coding experience, if, if, uh, if I wanted to code this up, um, the neural network, I mean, what do you need? It's like linear algebra routines, some nonlinearities. Uh, in the other part, uh, we really had to fight with you know, sparse matrices, uh, sparse linear solvers, the Newton's method, and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of remarkable, actually. Um, yeah, the value functions also look the same. Um, so it uh, was actually uh, quite nice to see that these are com uh, very, very competitive because you do have to realize that the uh, training problem for the neural network is completely not convex. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, there's an extension to mean field games. So you can incorporate other interesting running costs. So in this case, you can make the, the agents avoid this black region in the middle. You can do all sorts of modeling choices uh, in this framework uh, because everything can be computed here in moving coordinates. Um, there's much more to watch. I can have two of my favorites is uh, Levon Nebekian, one of my collaborators, he gave a beautiful uh, tutorial at IPAM. I put a link in here. The slides you can find, by the way, on my website. And also Sammy uh, have, has talked about an extension in our seminar. So, so these are already uh, works that are kind of related if you want to learn more about any of these aspects. So for the last few minutes, let me talk about 
applying these techniques um, from OT back in, in machine learning. And there's one problem called uh, continuous normalizing flows that is, has very much uh, the flavor of a semi-discrete OT problem um, and is, has received quite a lot of attention in machine learning. So think about the following situation. You have samples uh, down here, these blue dots from some distribution. You don't know the distribution. You just have samples like images or whatever. Um, and you want to map these to a normal distribution um, in order to, for example, estimate the density or in order to generate more of this data. Um, and you want to do this with an invertible mapping and we have uh, seen dynamical OT formulations now. So the idea is uh, to basically compute uh, trajectory and we've seen also the, uh, um, the way to solve a continuity equation. So you can think about computing those type of characteristics. So for every point, this point xn, for example, get map, gets mapped over to this z of xn. You've seen that before. Now that I have this mapping between the red dot and the blue dot, I can follow this trajectory here and compute the density. And I can do this for all the points now, and I can get an estimate of the density that hopefully is roughly aligned with the samples I put in. Okay, so, so this problem here is uh, solved with likelihood maximization. So basically what uh, my loss function simply is, I follow this, uh, this trajectory and then I plug in, um, I use basically the, the mont jamper equation to find the, find the density um, and I maximize the likelihood. It's interesting that not all of these, uh, these points kind of move to the center where the, maxim where the likelihood is, is the biggest, but that of course is because of the interaction between the agents as we saw in the previous example. Okay, so, so that is um, one way to solve the problem. Uh, I'd say it's not a great way because uh, these trajectories here are not really nice. Uh, they are bending. Think about the time integrator has to have a has to do a tough job to to tell them apart. Um, and, and maybe it's not the most natural uh, thing to no, not, not not the most natural way to get from A to B. So since I have sold you on optimal transport already, why not extend this whole formula and this whole problem by penalizing the transport costs? And also I would propose penalizing the, uh, pen, the violations of the Hamilton Jacobi equations along the way. If you do this, then you get a straight trajectory. So it's uh, giving you actually the same, um, the same density estimate, it's giving you the same mapping, but uh, you get there much cheaper. So first of all, the OT regularizes the problem. It uh, provides also the uniqueness. I mean, there are many ways to match two densities, but with OT you become unique. Uh, and it, honestly, it simplifies the time integrator. So your numerics has to work uh, way less hard if you go in a straight way. And uh, there have been many papers uh, recently that, um, that uh, have exploited this um, by other groups. Um, so um, we've, uh, we were quite encouraged by this and threw in our numerical treatment of, 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 of the problem. But um, it's, it's such a natural optimal transport uh, problem when you, when you first look at it. So, um, so these guys have all consistently found that using OT um, simplifies the whole problem uh, quite a lot and gotten very nice results. Um, okay, so um, one thing we've added, I, I, I mentioned the exact computation of the Laplacian. I've spent some time on this. Uh, in, an, in an automatic differentiation framework, you know you can only get matrix vector products with things like back propagation, forward propagation stuff. So you have to write the trace basically as a sum here with all the unit you know, standard basis vectors. So that requires you like, uh, like D different times of uh, the forward propagation. You can estimate the trace with like a Hutchinson estimate then you can reduce the cost. But here's uh, when you actually implement this efficiently in PyTorch on the GPU, which uh, by the way, I forgot to say my, my students, Derek and, and Xing Zhan and my former student, Sammy, who've done all the work. I had, had a picture a few slides back, uh, have done. Uh, so once uh, they pull all the, all the bells and whistles out, uh, here's what you get in terms of runtimes in different dimensions. Uh, so in, in these lines here, for example, you see the runtime uh, for, so this is the number of, of these terms in the sum. Um, and the, num time, the runtime really going up quite steeply um, for in, in a 700 dimensional space. Whereas with our way to exactly compute this thing, uh, you are basically superior even in runtime, which was surprising to us. And just to give you a feeling of uh, how accurate such a trace estimator would be, here is the relative error that you have. Uh, so kind of you need, actually, if you want to have some precision here, 
which for, for density estimation you will want to have, you actually need quite a lot of these. So this is really the se selling point that we can compute the trace exactly. It's highly parallel. And I mean, in flops, we actually don't win. Uh, but in terms of the parallel computing aspect, we do because it's all dense, dense uh, operations on the GP. Okay, so that's an advertisement for actually not forgetting all our skills in computing derivatives. Yeah, you can have uh, very flexible mappings. So all of these, you, these samples you can map to a Gaussian. Um, typically, so we've compared this with a method called Fjord. Um, Typically, uh, you, we have way fewer network parameters, so the triangle is where we are at. Um, so this is a, a measure of how good you fit. You want to be small and you want to be to the left. Typically, for most of the data sets we've tested, we move to the left without going up. There are two exceptions, but uh, let's see what we can do about that. And here's interesting comparison between the training and the testing time. So here you want to be close to the origin and uh, we move to the origin by an order of magnitude or so for all of the data sets and sometimes even much more. So that can be really a game changer in some of these uh, applications. You can use this for all funky stuff like generative modeling. Uh, so you can uh, use, for example, the MNIST data sets. Uh, so you have uh, some, some digits, so you're given this digit, this and this and this, the one in the corner, and then you can basically in interpolate between these different ones. So if you go diagonally, for example, you go from a nine uh, to a one in a hopefully smooth way. I mean, the test can't be super smooth because uh, you can imagine the space to be discontinuous at some point. Um, but yeah, you can do this once, once, these, fl once these flows are trained um, and uh, can have all sorts of fun with this. So let me wrap up. Um, so one advertisement is for the first part of the, of the talk. Uh, we have a Julia code online that, is, uh, that you can use to get exactly the same results we, we have published in that paper. Um, and coming very soon is going to be a, a PyTorch implementation that is then pulling all these uh, efficiency tricks to, um, and making it more accessible to machine learning people um, to, to play with for normalizing flows. And let me briefly sum up. So when you take machine learning me methods to optimal transport, um, I would say this is attractive for high dimensional PDEs. I mean, I showed you in two dimensions, we are competitive, but it's not where we want to be competitive. We want to be um, competitive in the high dimensional case. That's where you should use these techniques uh, because they don't have the non-convexity, uh, the, they don't have the convexity that uh, nice methods for 2D or 3D have. Um, yeah, we are completely mesh-free. We combine all sorts of interesting math. Uh, we paid a lot of details, uh, 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 focus uh, on the details, um, and it really mattered in the end. And yeah, the surprise is uh, you can sometimes be even competitive to convex solvers. You can apply these also to machine learning problems. Um, I would say don't take chances, use an exact trace computation, not some estimate. Uh, uh, just uh, re re like derive uh, your, your Laplacians and you can get some nice speed ups. And I should say there's a lot more to be done in this area. So between machine learning and OT, I mean, you saw Gabriel Perez talk a few weeks back. I mean, it's a very active interface. Uh, and we only uh, looked at a very specific uh, type of problem here, but there's a lot more synergies uh, between these communities, I feel, and uh, a lot more opportunities. So I'm, I hope I left a little bit of time and some energy and in, in interest in, in you guys for some nice Q&A. And, &A. and um, yeah, thanks again to the organizers for, for having me here for the talk. <laughs>